I'm going to talk to you all today about how we build a groundbreaking data visualization uh, in six weeks. And if you don't know a little bit about myself, this is just a quick intro. My name is Manuel Lima. Uh, over the past, you know, 15 plus years, I've worked at various companies, you know, big and small, you know, big like Google and Microsoft, but also small like Code Academy and a few others. Um, and I've really worked across all sort of design touch points you can think of, right? From websites to apps, you know, software applications, TV, games, really like the full gamut of, of user experience. I've also, some of you might know, I've also wrote a few books on data visualization, information design, and, and visual culture. Uh, these are, you know, my three past books uh, that I wrote. Um, but here today, I'm actually going to talk to you about my current role at Interis, where I lead all design, research, and data uh, visualization. So Interos AI is, we are really, it's a, a startup based out in Washington, even though we are a completely globally remote team. And Interos is really trying to use the power of AI to create a living map of your business ecosystem. And because I'm a geek for complexity, this is like my, my calling, if you can call it such. So we're really trying to sort of map every relationship, every risk, monitor and model even for the future. So what does that all mean? And, and, and actually all this, all of that look like. So this is, um, this is the homepage actually of our product of Interos, where you see basically your entire ecosystem, right? Your ecosystem of suppliers, let's say that you are a customer of ours and you have a network, right? An ecosystem, as we call it, of different suppliers. Those suppliers can be your direct suppliers. So tier one, your supplier suppliers, like a tier two, and a supplier, 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 tier three, and so on and so on. So it's a really, really complex system. And every single supplier in your ecosystem has a score, right? And cumulatively, your entire ecosystem has a score based on different metrics like cyber, security, geopolitical security, finance, stability, et cetera, right? So there's a variety of things that allow us to create, to give you a score, right? A risks-based uh, score. We also had a map until about one year ago. This was the only map, the living map of your entire ecosystem looked like this. We still have it, and it's going to go through a lot of iterations. But this was the only thing we had, right? Just map, which is still immensely valuable. You can actually see all your suppliers uh, around the globe, you know, where they are. You know, if you can see the geographical sort of concentration of your entire ecosystem of suppliers. But users wanted more, right? We talked very closely with a lot of our customers. And there were two specific use cases that they were really keen on. One is, I want to see what our risk companies are in my tier two and tier three, let's say, and how do they connect back to me? So this idea of how, do, how am I connected to these companies was really, really paramount. And we didn't have any feature like that uh, for that use case. And of course, the second one being that was just, you know, I was, I just opened this New York Times article. I saw that maybe solar winds just got a cyber uh, breach. Like, is this company in my ecosystem? And how close is that company to me, right? How exposed am I through this, through this process? So this was, you know, what we wanted to solve, right? This was the problem we had at our end. But just so that you understand the challenge we also had, uh, I'm going to show you a few slides that better expose the complexity of what we are facing, right? So at the moment, we have a lot of data. We have tons of data in Terras. We have roughly 350 million companies in our database. And that number keeps on growing every single day. It's basically your Nikes and Starbucks of the world Fortune 500s, but also like the daily corner of, in the corner of your street, right? Every types of businesses being mapped. So when you have a complexity this, of this size, it's, it's daunting to visualize anything, right? Uh, even if you focus on a subset, it can still be very large. As an example, customer A has 26,000 companies in tier three, right? And that's a lot of companies, right? 
Uh, if you took one second to interact with each of those 26,000 companies, it would take us, it would take you more than seven hours to over all 26,000 companies. So even from an interaction design standpoint, you can start seeing some of the challenges that we have. And customer A, and these are, by the way, these are letters, but these are also real customers with real uh, numbers, okay? So customer A was not even our worst case scenario, our edge case. We had customers like B and C that have much larger ecosystems. Uh, customer C, when you go down to like tier three, it's like in the hundreds of thousands of suppliers. So again, a pretty large number for us to like wrap our heads around and make a meaningful experience. And of course, you can argue that meaningful groups, clusters, and aggregates are absolutely paramount to make sense of this complexity, right? To identify patterns and consuming this data. And that's exactly what we do across the product. You know, you can group things based on things like score, right? On revenue, number of employees, but we actually allow our customers to create any group whatsoever. They choose the criteria, they choose the metrics, right? So having this ability to create meaningful groups that are relevant to them is a huge um, aspect of our product. And of course, you can still rely on search, right? To filter through the noise. Search is still a super, super powerful tool and finding again the design signal within the, the, the ecosystem. But even search has limitations and the limitations are really about relationships, which is what I'm gonna to talk to you today, right? When we consider edges, right? The relationships, the ties between suppliers, the problem escalates handfold and it becomes difficult. And we, we face this all the time in our product. It becomes so difficult that it's both hard for machines to process. There's a lot of latency issues. And it becomes, of course, hard also for humans to make sense and understand what they are actually seeing. Yet, we don't have to show everything all the time. When we can prioritize and give users control over what they want to see, right? This is a much desired path. And this actually always takes me back to this beautiful information seeking mantra by Ben Schneiderman, which I love. Uh, it tells us that we should focus on providing an overview first, zoom and filter, and then details on demand, right? And this was very much the principle or the mantra we also carried to a lot of the work that we, we ventured on. All right, so we had the problem. We had, now that you understand a little bit about the complexity we have at hands, let's look at what we actually get to build. We started off by, you know, getting inspired and immediately sort of the circle metaphor came to mind for us as a way of building this new feature, this new visualization. And of course, why the circle? Well, of course I did wrote a book about circles so I could talk about <laughs> for hours about circles, but that's a <laughs> tangent somehow. But the circle is really this metaphor for unity, right? For movement, for, for globa globally, um, you know, sort of transfers. And of course, connectivity, right? For global connectivity. It maybe might not by accident, our logo is also a circle, uh, the logo of our company. And of course, even the globe that you see there, that's a really cool visualization. It's part of our website still today, which is very, you know, a strong element of our own branding, right? So circles are really part of the company in some way, shape or form. So we started looking for various projects that could really get us the feel of what we were looking after, right? For this specific visualization. And these are some of the projects we were looking at. And it, it even took me back in time, you know, to the early days of like visualcomplexity.com, uh, a website that I've been, I've been maintaining since 2005. And some of the families that we were trying to do, and we really liked this sort of approach where you had this idea of concentric rings and each concentric ring could po possibly signify tiers, right? How close these suppliers are to you. So that was something there for us to, to explore. We started, of course, sketches. I always say, you know, students to audiences like this one, like it's the best way. Always, always start with pen and paper because there's no limits to your creativity instead of just jumping straight into any tool, right? So we always start like this, sketching uh, pen and paper. 
And what was our first iteration? So this was our very, very, very first iteration of, of a visualization tool that is now live on the product, has been immensely successful, has been patented already, and it's codenamed Galaxy because it kind of resembles a Galaxy, right? And this was the very first iteration of the Galaxy. So you can look at your entire ecosystem of suppliers, right? And then the, each ring, each concentric ring is uh, a tier, right? Tier one is your direct suppliers, the closest to you. Tier two is, again, your supplier suppliers, and so on and so on. We wanted to make this a very scalable design process so that at some point in the future, we can actually add more tiers, which has been you know, in the works for, for quite some time within our company, like tier four, tier five, and again, when you go to tier five, my God, the level of complexity, it's, it's almost like the entire globe, right? All companies, it's just nuts. Um, and we wanted to also start exploring how this connectivity could meet, could look like, right? If I was to click on a given supplier, would I see the direct relationships to me? Would I see relationships to others? We're kind of exploring this kind of like early stage dynamic just from an interaction standpoint as well, right? And from the early stages, we decided to create this very sort of egocentric view of, of the universe where you are, you're the sun, you are the star of your, of your galaxy, you are at the very core, right? So you can actually see this blue dot there where you are the core and then everything is somehow um, navigating around you. So that was the first iteration, you know, first early sketches, digital sketches. The second iteration, we started getting a little bit more serious on some aspects. We changed the orientation a little bit. We wanted to expose how many companies you have and different tiers. We wanted to make search a bit more prominent as well. We also started playing with this idea of color, right? And, and risk is something that we care very deeply, right? And we use also, of course, in our product, always this spectrum of you know, from green to red. If a company is really safe, right? That the risk is really low, they tend to be green. If the risk is really high, it tends to look more red, right? So here we want to test that assumption of like, hey, show me only the safest companies, right? Or, you know, the, the best use case, of course, is show me the most dangerous companies, right? The, the, the ones that I have, but there are, there are, that are more at risk that I should be paying attention to, right? So this is the view of like showing this, the riskiest companies in your ecosystem, you know, in this set of concentric rings. Uh, this is some early inspirations for search, right? And we always had this idea of searching for two companies uh, at the same time, which is really powerful, right? It creates this like really interesting love triangle. So I can search for like, let's say a censure and I can see how this company is connected back to me, right? And it also connects to others in my tier ones and twos and threes respectively. But I can also add another company, right? And see how the two companies are connected between themselves, if they are, and how they actually connect back to me, right? So it creates this like really dynamic sort of love triangle that's really fun to sort of explore. And this is when, you know, at the second stage, we started also playing with some guidelines, you know, red lines, putting some structure in place so that uh, we had enough real estate to show and to display a lot of the data and a lot of the information we, we wanted to. Uh, we had this idea of, of bands, you know, not so much concentric rings of bands that had a lot of flexibility to ingest large numbers of suppliers of circles. It was kind of a mix of concentric rings with circle packing technique, which is really uh, cool. Um, so it allows us like a lot of, space for many companies because we really want again we are dealing with sometimes we're like thousands and thousands of suppliers so once we had an idea of the design we went straight away to code right this is like what you see here is our first coding experiment of this and as you can see on the right side we left a lot of variables open for to definite for for us to play with and for to define them as we felt comfortable. So these are some, some variables we could control, you know, things like the coloring, you know, color palettes, you know, size of the circles, you know, the, even the distance between the tiers, everything was, was changeable. We were like tweaking all of this like 
constantly to make sure we had you know the design kind of right and it felt good from a layout standpoint we we also started to test relationships which was always the hardest part right we started pulling that data trying to see if that makes sense you know if there's any sort of edge cases that could break our our um our structure our layout so this is what we're doing and immediately as soon as we had a running an interactive prototype coded we tested you know i always say this that just test as soon as you can as soon as you can and we tested you know we tested in this stage uh, it was not refined at all we had like all these open panels with like all this refinement still looking kind of uh very much work in progress right but it was still really useful because after the testing you know we tested with a handful of customers and immediately we started noticing the things that were working right how clear certain aspects of the UI were, but also the things that could definitely be improved, you know, and we learned how, you know, search, you know, things like filtering is always hard. Uh, there was a lot of struggle there and we wanted to make it better for our customers. So always use, use the research in your project. That would be one, rec one of my recommendations. So I'm just gonna show you the final iteration. So this is like the final design we, uh, again, it's the same principle of concentric rings, but now we add a lot more elements on the UI, like things like search and, uh, you know, tables. And we also want to make filters a very sort of like, almost as a sentence, right? Where you would see things uh, like this sentence of, show me this number of supply of my riskiest, and then you can change that supplier sized by connections, right? And divide it in three tiers. And the things in blue would be changeable, right? You could actually change all of this. And we had this idea of controlling risk by the slider, which was became super popular and customers love this ability of this flexibility. Uh, this is, again, the safest, showing now the safest. I just changed here for risk is the safest. Uh, these are just, you know, again, several details of this dynamic uh, filter sentence that we we're playing with. Again, very human friendly not just like a series of, of boxes and drop downs, but in a very familiar sort of human readable sentence. These are just iterations of this. And then just more details on the UI, right? So if I click on a dot, what happens? You know, if I click on search, just detailing the whole understanding. We had this like a little sample of a supplier of a company with a lot of details. And if you were to click here, the company profile, you would go into our, uh, we have a dedicated page for every company in our product. Again, each one of our 500 something million companies uh, with a lot of more detailed information, you know, where they are, you know, how many employees they have, you know, when they were they funded, et cetera. A lot of firmographics as we call it. So plan the future also, like we, a lot of the, the things sometimes we end up doing is yes, it's important that we plan for the MVP and we try to do, you know, the minimum lovable product, I should say, the MLP. But we know that it's impossible to do everything right as an MVP, right? It's There's a, a lot of things we want to do in continuing enhancing and improving, right? It's a continuous process, always is, when it comes to digital products. So once we add the MVP, we plan for future cycles, future sprints, and the various iterations like VC1, you know, VC2, VC3. So these are all the announcements that are coming. So we know what are coming. We can actually tell our customers uh, many of the improvements that uh, will come into the product uh, in the future. You know, even things like the filters, what kind of filters we have, what new filters will be added and when. And so that's it. I don't. I think I'm running out of time, so I don't have time for a demo per se. But uh, we have uh, our right? time buffer for break, so you have time to finish your talk and oh, show okay. uh, us Perfect. the so, demo. Oh, great, great. Let me just show you the demo then. And then what I would say is that you saw the map that I shared before. This is something that we are planning, and this is we are super excited. This is like super kind of. Uh, coming, it's very new, very fresh, but we are really trying to integrate weather information into our maps. You can see your suppliers and you can see things like flood risk and earthquakes and, and tornadoes as they are happening and see how that could actually impact risk 
and of course all the network of supplies that you have as well so these are things that are uh, in progress right now so let me show you my let me just escape this little thing here and i will show you the demo so this is oh, one second here Maybe I can, I'm going to stop sharing. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to share this other screen here. I agree with Piero that the phrase minimum lovable product is great. <laughs> it's a good one, right? I love that. It's, and we, we try, uh, yeah, I could do a whole presentation about that, but it's, it's a, a really fun thing. So here it is, right? Just. The, the dots, I can roll on them, I can just see, and I click any dot, and then I would just basically see how this company is connecting. Sorry, this is taking a bit a bit of time. I would see that this connect this company is connected to me. It's on my tier two, it's connected to me through this one, PAX technology, right? There's just one step and it connects back. I can just click here and just see the company profile. Uh, I can also change the the this dynamic thing here so now i'm looking at the riskiest riskiest right the ones that have like 20 uh, as a 20 or below score which is like you know pretty um so bad that we're just so green i can just control this a bit more so you here i am and then i can say let's say apple let's see how apple is connected back to me um uh for solar winds, let me see this. Okay, so let's say I got this one here. And then it's gonna tell me basically how it connects back to me because this now this company is actually on my tier three right and you can see now the the, the shortest path connects back to this one connects back to this and this and then i can see the company's profile right and the company profile if it's unlocked it would give me a lot of information on some of the cyber risks right it seems like it's pretty low on like finance cyber restriction this one is actually uh, uh locked but i can unlock it you got a lot of uh, more information so this is it in short there's a lot more here to see but this is kind of like the the uh, running demo of our product so i'm gonna stop now because you know I, I love questions and if people have questions i would love to answer them yes we have um questions i'll start from q a session um you said to start with sketching but uh, it's a big challenge of data visualization is making sure whether the visualization style you choose is suitable for your data and what you want to represent and uh, how this could be accomplished through sketches. Right. Yeah, yeah. of course, you cannot really like, uh, you know, have the complete finalized idea in a sketch, you know, with pen and paper. But, you know, it's really important that you start having an idea, at least making some assumptions through drawing, I would say that, right? Make your assumption through drawing first. Uh, and then of course, your assumptions could be wrong to your point, right? And I think you asked that question, NNN, NNN, your questions are spot on, right? Uh, and your assumptions could be, uh, could be wrong. And of course, when you do start playing with real data, that's when, you know, that's when things really become serious because you start seeing if your assumptions are right, if they, if you should reconsider the layout, if you should reconsider the design and so on. So at every stage, there's benefits, right? There's benefits of like doing a sketching first, create some assumptions, testing those assumptions with real data and a running prototype. And of course, testing even more your assumptions when you actually show it to customers, right? Every stage has its benefits in terms of like getting to the final, uh, hopefully the right solution for the problem at end. And the next question, uh, what technology uh, was used to create this mapping tool? 
Yeah, so we use the mix of key lines. Key lines is like the super powerful tool uh, based in Java that allows you to, again, create a lot of relationships without the system failing on you. And it was a mix of key lines and, and D3, of course. Some of the some of the circuit packing methodology we use was a kind of a custom a custom way from D3, a custom layout from D3. It was all custom, but D3 and key lines were two tools we that were kind of critical for us to make this happen. And uh, I like to add the comment about sketching. Uh, in my experience, business intelligence analysts um, afraid of sketching because uh, you may draw interesting uh, visual map or chart which customer uh, would accept but you can't build uh, it uh, with a default uh, tool like tableau or power bi and uh, uh, it may require custom uh, visual that's why uh, analysts usually usually don't uh, don't use this technique that's true alex that's yeah. And next question uh, in the chat. How do you manage to convince the first 100 companies to believe in the idea that the product is going to get this big? And data training-wise, how did you keep working with limited data uh, during first steps? Oh, that's a tough question. Yeah, I mean, I, we didn't... We, we never start by convincing the first five, 100 companies. We, we started much... With a much smaller number, right? You always start with like maybe a handful of companies and, and then you start building up trust, right? And with trust, hopefully you have a good relationship with many of your customers and they believe in your vision, right? More so than what you actually have already running in the product. So for that, there, there needs to be a lot of trust, right? In your capability to, to deliver. And that's the type of relationship we have with our, with our customers, right? I think they are always using what we have, but also knowing what we will have in the future. Uh, so that's the kind of relationship we have. And then of course, yes, we didn't have enough data. So there was a lot of data acquisition that we had to do. We had to buy data, we had to scrape data. We have a whole AI team scraping data all the time uh, for companies around the world. Um, and sometimes there's also the process now of many of our customers uh, uploading their own data. And we can make inference inf inferences a, a, many times about that data and create new data based on that, right? So our data growth is is a constant, right? Which is also scary, uh, especially because you end it doesn't have it's not always so balanced. What I mean is that you end up having a lot of get great coverage. Let's say let's talk about firmographics, for example, right? Firmographics are like almost demographics, but for companies, like the data points on companies, like we have a lot on like the year that the company was founded, public domain information, all that. But then for finance information, it's hard to get sometimes, right? Depending where this company is in the world, depending on what government governs them. It's just really, really complex when, because we this is a global thing. We're not talking about one specific country. So there's a lot of different, you know, logistics, different logic, different laws, which poses challenges. But data growth is challenging. It's not always balanced. We nev we're never going to have all the data available, but, you know, step by step, we're going to get there, right? And, and it's not so much, again, that having data on everything, it's about creating value on the data that you have, creating a meaningful experience that customers cannot live without. That is absolutely paramount for them to use on a daily basis to make sense of their supply chain and to help them solve real problems in real life. That's what we are striving for. Great words. And the last question in our time slot. Uh, I hope it will take a simple answer. Is this Hazard's dashboard a commercial product as well? Or this is something like a portfolio project? No, no, it's a real product. Go to interos.ai. It's a real product. If you are keen, you can actually become one, one of our customers. So our, our customers are, you know, large companies like NASA and, and others like of that size. Uh, but we have a few other small customers as well that are really interested in, you know, in finance space, in banking. They're, again, like they're really trying to understand, you know, the ramifications of their entire ecosystem of suppliers. But it's a, definitely a real product. 
And you can find more information at interos.ai.